Hey guys, I'm really excited about today's podcast, uh, mainly because Mary Highland is joining me. And so uh, I met Mary years ago on LinkedIn, and she is that person that I go to when it comes to uh, governance questions, leadership, and a development committee type questions when it comes to your board of directors. Now, Mary is an industry icon. I'm going to call her that. She has over 40 years of experience leading organizations, coaching organizations, uh, and boards. And so um, I just love her angle. She's actually done board trainings for uh, some of my clients where I've just got to sit at her feet and really learn from her. So over the years, I've been keeping this list of things that my clients ask me. Uh, and I, I think I know the answer to, and I answer them, but I thought, let me actually jot those down and let's talk to Mary. Let's let me just run through the questions so that uh, anybody who listens to this has uh, has that advice straight from the mouth of somebody who knows what they're talking about. So that's what you're going to hear today. I'm going to go through these list of questions. Hopefully your question is on there. Um, I pulled them out of my own client questions and then I posted on LinkedIn and said, hey, these are the questions I'm asking. What do you want to add? Um, so we've got another good one there. But I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Mary Highland. Uh, all of the links to follow up with her. She has online courses, an amazing podcast that I've had the privilege of being on before. And um, I hope you'll just enjoy the conversation uh, that on my podcast as much as I've enjoyed getting to know her and having conversations with her. So here's the conversation. Mary Highland, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thank you so much, Sherry. I'm delighted to be here. Oh my here. goodness. Okay, so um, I I have my list of questions. You're the only one I would call to to be the person who I'm like, please tell me the answers, oh. Mary. Um, because you oh my you know you're my go-to when I'm when I'm like, wait, this doesn't sound quite right. So um I've been keeping this list of just comments and questions that my clients have, and we are literally gonna go through them today. They're very they're board specific, of course, leadership specific. Um but I might let you, in your own words, really just um, tell us why you're the expert. I know you're going you're gonna to cringe at that, but I just want you just to take a minute and say, this has been my journey. Um, this is what I realized as, a, as an executive director and now a coach, consultant, mentor. Just talk me through your journey, and then we'll pivot real quickly into these questions. Oh, well, thank you for the invitation to both be here with you to have this great conversation. I'm excited. And also to share a little bit. Well, I've been uh, in the nonprofit sector my whole career, over 40 years. I don't tell anybody how much over 40 years <laughs> anymore. But I, I started off and quickly became an executive and did that for 26 years, including a couple of mergers. So I ended up uh, my last role was running a very large nonprofit with 530 staff, mm -hmm. but I grew up uh, in the nonprofit and then we merged. And so I learned a lot about how that happens and all of that. And then I pursued a PhD uh, just because I left school in uh, leadership and ended up landing on governance in nonprofits and did my research on the relationship between the chair of the board and the executive mm -hmm. director. And I began to realize how little support there was out there for people to have effective boards, yeah. particularly for the executive directors. And there was a lot of board bashing going mm. on. And a lot of my experience was that boards are well-meaning people who really want to do the right thing. They're passionate about a mission. They just don't know, you yeah. know, what to do. And so I, that has evolved. My consulting and coaching practice has evolved. So I added another 20 years to my career doing that. Mm -hmm. And I also have my own podcast and a book. And so I'm really passionate these days about supporting executives mm -hmm. to step into more of a leadership role with their boards. Oh. And to they can do it. They should be doing it. And um, I'm working on... Uh, program about that related to board engagement. So good. Because you can't just sit back and wait for the board to do right. it. Right. Uh, as you talk, I have extra questions that are just like coming to me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to the list and then we'll, we'll if we have to go off okay. uh, script a little bit, we can. Um, Mary, I'm going to say okay. something just in response to uh, what you just said. 
I saw this post on LinkedIn and I've not stopped thinking about it. And it's very simple, but it, it just resonated so much with me. I didn't write it. But someone was saying that they felt like the greatest skill that a board member or the greatest thing that a board member can bring to the table is a, an attitude of learning. Um, and I think that's not always, you know, it's like we're bringing them because they're, they're a lawyer. We need expertise. We're bringing them because they're finest. We need, so bring all your expertise and rah, the expertise. But when it comes to have we ever been on a board before? Have you ever fundraised? What does it look like to serve on a board? That's when this spirit of learning has to be present. And I thought to myself, that's right, man, that would really solve, you know, you know, I'm coming at it from a fundraising perspective, but man, that would solve a lot of like, if, if board members were learners and said, teach me, you know, equip me. Um, oh my gosh, that would change an organization's yeah. trajectory. Right. Well, what you're talking about is an element of the culture of the board. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, I, I'm passionate about learning and professional development and learning was always very important to me as an executive. And I expected staff to be interested in learning yes. and ran into some who weren't, which was a big shock to me because yeah. I thought everybody was. Mm -hmm. But you are right on because it's so important if we're going to build relationships to start first with being willing to learn about yeah. each other. Yeah. And this is one of the key things that I've learned is that when board members come on, we either, you know, as executives or other board members, we don't spend enough time, invest the time to really get to know each yeah. other. And if someone isn't open to doing that with others and see themselves as I had one of my staff say, I'm done. Mm. I'm not, I don't need professional development. He was insulted. Oh, anyway, oh. that's another story for <laughs> that's another, another That's time. another episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I really agree with you that it's related to being open. It's related to being curious yes. about other people and situations. All those characteristics are really important yeah. for board members. Yeah. And I think not just board member to board member, but to the fundraising staff, to the executive team, to the program staff. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Before I go, keep stay on this topic. Okay. I've got my questions. Um, I have six or seven and then, uh, Mary, I put it on LinkedIn, which you saw, and then people kind of added a few more. So I've, I've added a few more, but I think it'll oh, be fluid. Okay. Okay. So if you're cool okay. with it, I am going to just kind of go through yeah. the questions. We're going to have a conversation about it. You can, you just going to lay your 40 plus plus years on top of this and tell us what's what. <laughs> Okay. okay. Well, you know, I'm going to start with one that I uh, I get often. And that phrase that I hear is, um, my board feels that fundraising is not their responsibility. And so I just want you to talk through, like, ultimately, is that the truth? Um, is fundraising a board's responsibility? Let's just start with the jump in the deep end. Okay. This is, this is a tough one, Cherry, yeah. because of the potential overlap between the board role and the staff mm -hmm. role. I tell boards and executives that fundraising specifically is not necessarily the responsibility of the board. The responsibility of the board is to ensure that your nonprofit has the resources it needs to advance the mission. The board's job primarily is to advance the mission and you can't do that without resources. Yeah. So I have had clients who had earned income, lots of government money. They didn't fundraise because that wasn't part of their financial model. Mm -hmm. You know, you need diversified sources and fundraising is a very important yeah. one. But if you are fundraising, then I see two roles for the board. One, or jobs even, mm -hmm. uh, one is to give you know, you can't ask anybody outside your organization or even in your organization, frankly, to yeah. make a contribution to your mission if the board members aren't willing to make a contribution. So I'm very passionate about that. And I think it's critical because it's you saying this mission is important mm -hmm. and valuable. And the thing that one of the arguments I get, I'll just toss in there is volunteer work doesn't count as a substitute for mm. that. You know, I'm volunteering my time, so I shouldn't have to give. Yes. forget that. I hear that. Uh, yes. So, 
So it you do need to give. And the second one is, um, and you know, you're the fundraising professional, not me. So I say this with a little bit of a grain of salt. I think that board members have the responsibility and it's not just for fundraising, but to build relationships. Mm -hmm to build social capital for the organization. Social capital is the asset you have by virtue of your relationship. If you are good at being an ambassador for your mission, then building relationships for people who, with people who are interested in that mission, you're not trying to twist people's arms here. Um, you're not a salesperson. You're building involvement and relationships around the mission. And if you're not passionate about that, you shouldn't be on the board anyway. Yeah. But that, I think, adds to and builds the capacity of the organization to raise money because those are the people that you raise money from. But, yes. you know, I find board members are very uncomfortable making the ask and they characterize fundraising as asking for money. Yeah. Well, they're wrong about that, in my opinion. It's about relationships with people who care about your mission. Mary, we're officially up on the soapbox together. So um, <laughs> okay. I 100% agree with you. Yes, I want everybody giving, and I want every board member giving their best gift, hands down. If $50 is mm -hmm. a board member's best gift, that is amazing. And if $50,000 is your board member's best gift, that is amazing too. So I'm totally in agreement. Yes. And I can't tell you, um, even I remember uh, starting a board training one time, and the board members went around and introduced themselves. And, and one woman uh -huh. said, like, my name is Sherry, and I'm not asking people for money. Well, well, well welcome, Sherry. You know, <laughs> like, it was that direct. Um, oh, my God. When, when I wanted to say what you so nicely articulated is that actually being a ambassador for the mission, the networking, the educating, the connecting, being the mouthpiece, that's actually fundraising. And that's the fundraising I need the board doing. Um you know, I, I rarely have board members ask people for money. Uh, the staff should be experts at that. They should have the tools, the skills, uh, the the training to be great solicitors. So right. um, especially when we're talking I at the top agree. of the pyramid, uh, that we're not events, not appeals. It's relationships. Um, That's right. Frankly, it's the, it's the I would say, uh, it's not easier, but it, it's the more fun way of fundraising. And it's, it's usually it's something that's very natural to even a board member. They're like, oh, that's what I do in my real job. I, I network. I Right. It's very natural if we let it be. Right. Right. And, and but I find that um, board members don't know that they don't have to make the ask. Yes. And so they have this myth and they have a lot of beliefs also, which is not you know, if that's not one of your questions, we're not going into well, that, that are wrong mm -hmm. about it, that make them more anxious about it. Yes. So I think it's important to, to empower them. Yes. Yes. To use their passion for the mission. So good. I always, um, when I hear people say, I hate fundraising, especially a board member, I say, actually, you hate what you yes. think fundraising is. Yes. Good news. It's Great something totally to different. It. So yay, we, we get to be learners. And I'm going to tell you, it's actually something different. And I promise you, mm -hmm. it's not as scary as you think. Right. So good. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, the other little part of this, I, I we won't spend as much time on every question, but the other thing I'm thinking of, Mary, is That's okay. I always say when it's like, is fundraising the role? And I think of even fiduciary responsibility. Um, I always say that, well, you know, it's a kind of a 50-50 game or approach on fiduciary responsibility. One half is, are we using, are we spending the resources? Are we budgeting from an expense side correctly or wisely? That's only 50% of, of, of the money, right? The other 50% is the revenue. And so even as board mm -hmm. members, like we can't put 50% of our energy and time into the budgeting and the nitpicking of the budgeting and resources if we're not going to put that right. same robust approach into the revenue side of it. Um, That's right. Do, I mean, is that kind of a, a, a different but okay way for me to describe it? Oh, yeah, I think it's absolutely right. I mean, again, board members are looking their responsibilities to ensure resources, let's say ensure capacity. Mm -hmm. If it's, it's more than just money, but you have to have capacity to deliver on your mission. You have to have people. So, 
you know, uh, some of my clients, a lot of those people are volunteers, but the board still has to have good systems yes. for getting the people they need into the organization and money, you know, and, and finances is a part. Yes. Part of that fiduciary responsibility is about how stable are your funding mm. sources? How diverse are your funding sources? I mean, you have to consider all of these things. And if your funding sources aren't diverse or they're too restrictive, I mean, one of the great things about fundraising is it's unrestricted money. Yeah. And I can't think of a nonprofit that wouldn't need that. So even when I was CEO, we had a lot of government grants, but we needed fundraising, maybe at a different level than others do, but we needed it for what I used to tell my board is that government money is like Swiss cheese. Mm. There's holes in yes. it. We need money to plug the holes of all the rules that we can't spend money on this or we can't spend money on yeah. that. And we have to have money to spend on that. Yeah. So. Number one reason people come to me, I hear you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to uh, yeah. skip down to a question that is a little bit money related since we're on the topic. Okay. Um, and this would be, uh, so I get this um Sometimes it's like, oh, well, we need to invest in something. I should hire somebody. I need a new technology. Um, and people will say, uh, well, I got to ask my board. And so the phrase mm -hmm. I put on here, I said, you know, people say, I always feel like I have to ask my board when I want to invest in an opportunity that is above and beyond the budget. Um, and so the question comes uh, of like, how much can an executive director make those daily decisions and deviate from an approved budget? Um, like, what is that line of, hey, it's not in the budget, but we need it. Um, like, what do you see as a, a best practice on, on, on above and beyond budgeted items that the board, that the executive okay. director needs to run their business? Um, that's a really good question, but it's also a very complex mm -hmm. question because uh, a budget is a plan, mm -hmm. but the budget is a plan that the executive and the board develop together. So if you've got goals for where you want to go, you need to be looking at a budget in terms of what do we need to invest in. So I think part of it is um, I can see where you're going, where you have challenges and you need to invest in something, but you didn't anticipate mm -hmm. it. So first thing is anticipate as much as you can things you may want to invest in or make sure you have a, a reserve fund or an R&D fund, you know, research and development fund where you have some money that you want to invest in and agree with the board sort of what are the criteria purposes mm -hmm. for that. So your relationship with the board is really, really important as an executive and board members like everybody else are going to have issues with money. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a money thing. The more you know your board members, the more you understand their personal perspectives and issues with money, the more you can craft agreements with the board proactively about what flexibility do you have as an executive. Yeah. I do strongly recommend you need a spending policy. You know, what is your authority, you know, your spending authority that you can spend up to this amount of money without having to come back to the board. Yeah. And that's going to depend probably on the amount of your budget. Mm -hmm. um, there are going to be things you want to inform the board about um, because they may have opinions right. about it. So you have to think about the relationship. Yeah. There isn't any magic number here. I think board members need to understand that the one number I will throw out is that any line item or board you know, budget item is going to vary maybe up to 10% in just because it's a plan, right? you know, you can't control all that. And so you want to have an understanding and you want your board to understand that if something varies 10%, nobody's going to freak out mm -hmm. about it. Yes. You know, whether it's we spent 10% more or we got 10% less, whatever, you're not going to freak out about yeah. it. And you're going to go to the board uh, reasonably frequently, at least quarterly, uh, and talk about, do we need to adapt the budget? Do we need to make a change? This isn't something you just look at once and you're done with. Yes. Uh, things happen, as you know. Um, so I think you do need to know what you have discretion to spend. Mm -hmm. And if you need more, then you have discretion to spend. Then I do think in a conversation with the board's appropriate, but it needs to be tied to your goals yeah. and help them see this is necessary. Yeah. 
but if you start off again, be proactive about having a, a development fund for the organization. Yeah. Some understanding of what positions do we want to fund next? What what do we want to have available to hire a consultant or an outside expert? Yeah. yeah. So it's I hear you. There's no one magic mm-hmm. answer to that, but I think it's again creating the culture yes. where you're going to invest in development of the organization. So good. It's a growth. It's a, um, you know, we, we invest in our, in our organization. We anticipate it's very, uh, a proactive versus reactive type of budgeting, uh, exercise, um, that I'm hearing from you because I, I do see that Mary, I see that, um, budgets come to me did last, you know, very recently. I said, now talk to me about the growth that's in this budget. Oh, it's, it's squeaked by. It's barely anything. And so I will spend the first month of my engagement with people saying, yeah, but what should be in your budget that would propel your growth, A, and that your fundraising team needs to be raising toward, or we're not going to get on that forward propelling, you know, revenue generation path. That's right. That's right. Uh, And, and board need, boards need to get it that you have to invest in your infrastructure. Yes. And if you're not doing that, this idea that every dollar goes to program is just frankly wrong. Bonkers. And particularly <laughs> if you're young, you know, a young nonprofit. I just talked to somebody the other day who's a founder. Uh, she's not even taking a salary mm. and she's talking about expanding program. And I said, whoa, back up. Stabilizing your own role with a salary is probably job number one. Good. There might be other infrastructure things you need to do, but boards need to understand that they're leading an organization Mm -hmm. and advancing the mission requires building a sustainable organization, not just doing programs. And yeah, you know, that's so good. Uh, I love that you said the the 10% because one little tip that I give people, I do it for my own life, uh, my own business is that oftentimes I think we have a, uh, we need a, some objectivity on an expense. And so like, let's pretend uh, an organization said we, we need a website or, and it's, it's uh, we need it to do all these fancy things. And it's $50,000. And it's like, I would never spend $50,000 on a website that would, but could transform, you know, your client experience, mm-hmm. your donor experience. I always tell people, well, let's look at that in percentage of budget. You know, when, Oftentimes it's like it's 0.0002% of your overall budget. Oh my gosh. What, yeah. what, why are we, why are we even talking about this? Or even if it's 1%, yes. is it, are we really having this conversation about something that is maybe less than 1% or even 2% of your budget? Cause we're acting like this is a 40% budget change. And so oftentimes I find if we that's, shift it from so dollars to percent, it's like, oh, that's a good strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, and the, the other thing that I just thought of uh, with executives and going to the board for permission, when you develop your budget, make sure you are not getting into the weeds mm. in your line items because you don't want your board having to approve something within, you know, so totally. let's say you have a professional development budget. And you have flexibility to spend within that. You encourage a, one of your direct reports to hire an executive coach for a period of time. You have some flexibility, but if you put down all the details, like conferences, workshops, coaches, yeah. and those are all listed separately, you're inviting your board to get involved yes. in areas that are too detailed for them. So start with the right budget to begin with. Okay. You know, I I, I talk budget on every single it's so critical. Uh, I, that's such good advice, Mary. Okay, next question. I'm talking committees. Um, okay. Should a should I have committees? Um, especially, usually people are asking me, should I have a fundraising committee? Uh, we'll start there, and then I want to know who in the world should be preparing and setting the agenda for these committee meetings because I think I see a lot of people doing it wrong. So first. Should we have committees? When should we? All the things. Okay. So I'm going to share a principle that is not just about committees, but it's about committees. 
And that is, um, it's four P's. First is purpose. Before you establish any structure in your nonprofit, work group, ad hoc committee, committee, you need to know what's the purpose. Mm -hmm. The purpose is critical. Once you know what your purpose is, what are you trying to accomplish? What's the result you want? Then you need to think about who should be involved in this? Mm -hmm. Who has what we need to make this happen? And those become then the members of your committee or the group you decide to bring together. That group, in my opinion, that group decides. Now, there may be reason, particularly at the board level, for a chairperson of that committee to be appointed by the board. Mm -hmm. um, it may just be the natural thing that evolves. Um, but you, the committee's involved in deciding how are we going to structure ourselves? Who's going to do what? What's our process for getting this goal achieved? And the committee decides that. Sometimes this could involve staff. It can involve volunteers, whatever your resources are to achieve your goal. So if fundraising is your goal, that would be a committee. Now, whether you call it fundraising or fund development or whatever you call it, if you want a group to be the leadership hub of your fundraising, then that might be an appropriate structure to have. The agenda then is about what is that group together deciding in terms of who's the leader. There should be somebody, and this could be a staff person, it could be the chair, volunteer, board member, it could be the development director and the board chairperson who's in mm -hmm. charge of that, uh, who's got fundraising expertise. I think that can be flexible. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have to be rigid about that. Form follows function. Figure out what works, um, but also be sensitive about what the job is. Um, anytime you're leading a group, you need to be a good facilitator. You need to be inclusive. You need to realize it's not about your agenda. It's about the group's mm -hmm. success. And so there needs to be some criteria yeah. for who this person who would lead it is. Yeah. And then if that person who leads it is going to own the agenda, that could be fine if they're keeping the purpose in mind and making sure the agenda is focused and facilitate to include people on making sure you're making progress mm -hmm. in achieving what you need to achieve. So yeah. I don't know. I went all over the place. No, that's good. That, but... I think what I... Um... You know, I'm kind of thinking of this question in a lot of scenarios that I see where the development director is coming to the fund development committee meeting and has set the agenda is almost reporting out of activities versus having it be uh, what is that function or like what is the goal? What, why, why do we exist? Um, where I would want the fund development committee to be more like how is that committee helping the board to provide resources to the organization or move the mission forward, as you said? And so right. I find it as this, um, it's, a, it's a tremendous weight to put on an already uh, very busy development director um, to be coming oh, yes. and reporting out. And um, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm being protective of my development directors a little bit. Yeah. So it's not another yeah. thing to be reporting to or another agenda to set when um, I don't I don't know that that's really the, the intention of the committee. Well, no, I mean, I think that's part of the discussion at the beginning. Why would the development director be sort of in charge of this committee? Um, maybe a support, but it's all, it really all comes down with what's the role of the committee mm -hmm. is the role of the committee to uh, think through strategy. Uh, to educate the board and empower the board. Uh, what is the role of the committee? Yeah. And do you have the right people on it? Yes. And then what is the role of the development director relative to that committee? Um, reporting out should never be done in a group setting, in my opinion. Yeah. Issues, issues should be brought to groups. Mm -hmm. You can always send people stuff ahead of time. And then you say, do we have an issue we need to talk through that's supportive of the development director? Where are the challenges? You know, maybe yeah. that's a thought partner group. Yeah, love that. So, yeah, I really. So that's 
the whole idea is why is the group there and how is it adding value? Yeah. And that might evolve over the years if it's been around for 10, 12 oh, years and, and just to come back to that. That's, that's a really good, like bringing us back to center on why this exists. Okay, right. next question. This is a fun one. Um, a prospective board member asked if he'd be paid for his service. <laughs> is that like okay. <laughs> even a thing or is that legal or what in the world? Well, technically... Uh, I can only speak for California. Mm -hmm. Now, every state has their own corporation's code that covers nonprofits. Okay. In California, the rule is that no more than that less than 51% of the board members should be compensated. So the thought that they can be compensated is out there. Mm -hmm. They could be. So, for example, there are nonprofits where uh, the CFO and the CEO are on the board. I'm not sure I agree with yeah. that. In fact, I don't really, but that's a different question. Yeah. Should the executive be on the board? Um, they're compensated employees and that's part of their job. So it's not, it depends. Um, but I have never in my entire career heard of or worked with a nonprofit where board members were compensated just for being, for being there members and not having, yeah, just for showing up, um, which again comes to this spending authority are, you should decide, are you going to reimburse board members for expenses? Mm. And if you are, what are the criteria? What's the policy? What's the process? Who decides all that kind of stuff, but uh, compensation, I think the culture of the nonprofit sector and certainly most nonprofits is no, that yeah. this is an unpaid volunteer position. Yeah. And you just say no to that person. If your nonprofit says we don't compensate board members, yeah. most don't. Um, yeah, and it's just a tone. I but would it's not a corporate want. model. That, so. Yes. I think that's well, what it's coming from. People are naive about that yeah. and they may be curious. And if they don't know, and they're innocently asking, that's one thing, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I think the answer is no, but it's probably not illegal. Yeah. And Mary, could you just uh, talk a little bit more? Like, what are your thoughts on board reimbursements? Because, of course, I see this all over the board, pun intended, um, of like one, be one board member, like, here's all my receipts. I need reimbursed. Uh, and, and the next one, uh, wanting a tally and having it subtracted from their give get. Like, talk, talk to me about this. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> Well, again, I have to say, I don't have a lot of experience with this, but I do think uh, if you come back to who's on your board and who are you inviting mm -hmm. on your board, we ran a large mental health agency and we wanted the perspective of family members who had a uh, people yes. in their family with mental illness. And we wanted to have someone who had personal experience with mental illness. Now, um, you don't assume up front that that person has no resources. Right. And it was it, it, a little diversion here for like giving and requiring everyone to give. Uh, we had someone on our board who was on disability, not very much income, to assume that she could not make a contribution or not even ask her would be insulting. Yes, yes. Would be stigmatizing to say, you know, you can't even give us a dollar, you know, Agreed. that would be ridiculous. So um, I think the compensation depends on, you know, what are you asking board members to do? Is there something unusual? But again, you need an upfront conversation about this yeah. before you even recruit yes. anybody to be able to say, uh, here are the board policies on expense reimbursement. First, the expenses should be authorized by the mm -hmm. board. I had one client who's had a board member. They were in a real estate situation. Mm -hmm. They needed to get some assessments of their building. And the chair of the committee working on that hired a consultant for $3,000 without permission. Oh, my goodness. There was no budget for it. He just thought, okay, I'm chairing this committee. I should we need be able it. to spend money. Yeah. And, <gasps> yeah. and um, so wow. again, money's a very sensitive issue and you want to get clarity yeah. on it. Um, 
I like to think that board members are, is, you know, saying, I don't need to be reimbursed. I mean, yeah. what do they need to be reimbursed for yeah. is really the question yeah. that would drive that. So good. Okay. So another, another good question here. Um, a large institution funds us each year and they want a representative from their company on the board kind of to represent their interests. Um, what do you think of that? Is that, is that legit? She's shaking her head. No, this already. I easy. love it. Okay. Talk to no. me. No, 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 no. So Mary, I see uh, this so often. The reason, oh my goodness. But look yeah. at duty of loyalty. Yes. Yes. Sherry, Talk to me about duty that. Of loyalty. You can't represent anybody's interests, but the interests of your nonprofit. If you're on the board, yes. that's the law. You can't be loyal to another group. So I, I teach a lot about recruiting. I have mm -hmm. an online course about recruiting board members. And one of the things I teach is get the word representative out of your mind, out of your mouth, because we use it not just for the kind of thing you're talking about, but for our constituents. You know, we want to have representatives on our board for the mm -hmm. clients we serve. No, you don't, because you're putting them in a position of thinking they are representing the interests of a group yes. outside of your nonprofit. Yes. They can't. However, they can bring the perspective of that community. They can bring the perspective of a person of color. And they use that perspective to inform and educate so you're making very good decisions yes. because a very diverse board makes better decisions yeah. than a non-diverse board. So... To have someone who gives you money on the board to protect the interests or to watch you or right. I don't know what is n not okay. No. And you can use the duty of care law as your leverage mm. against that. So you're not just saying you don't want that person. So now, good. if you want to create an advisory council, okay. if you want to do that and invite someone to be on that to keep your relationship going, Great. I don't mean you shouldn't have a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I like that fiery version of Mary Highland on 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 that topic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank oh my you. goodness. Um. Okay, I have two more. Uh, what order do I want to ask these in? Uh. Okay, I'll ask this this one here. Um, is there really such a thing as a working board? Uh, people will say, <laughs> I I, I want to get my board out of the weeds and be a governing board, but like we've been a working board, and oh, but now we need to be a governing right. board. How, how do you feel okay. about this, Mary? Well, I I do a lot of work in this area. And first thing I, I love to say to boards is all boards work. Mm -hmm. If you went to a governing board and said, do you work? <laughs> do you do work for this nonprofit? They're going to say yes. This is a real misnomer mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we have a working board. Having said that, I realize this is something that's evolved in the sector and what they really mean by a working board is a board that has board members who are doing the day-to-day -day work yes. of the organization. Uh, in addition to governing, if you're lucky, <laughs> sometimes instead of governing because they don't have the capacity to do more. So for these organizations, Doing the day-to-day -day work of the organization is not governing. Mm -hmm. And so you're not fulfilling your responsibilities as a board member. You are missing out on all of the benefits that good governance will get for you. So you absolutely want to transition to be a governing board. And one of the, if we have time, one of the yeah. ways I help people think about that is particularly newer organizations that don't have a lot of staff, obviously this is where this shows up because the board members are volunteering yes, in yes. the organization, is begin to get crystal clear about what's the day-to-day -day operation, what is governing. And when you're clear about that, then you decide as a transition, number one, you're gonna recruit people for governing only. You're gonna look at what strategies you need to implement to build your volunteer staff mm -hmm. who can do the day-to-day. -day. And in the interim, when you're making this transition, when you're having a board meeting, you have a governing board meeting, and then you adjourn and you convene as a management team, mm. a leadership team to handle the day-to-day -day work that the people there are doing. So you have some 
supervision, some coordination. Love that. But you separate, you separate the day-to-day yeah. from the governance. Yeah. Even if it's the same people. But That's good. You know, if they have capacity to do both, think of it as two hats. Right. One is staff, one is unpaid staff, staff, one is board member. I love that. That's a very, that's a, I love the clarity you're with the two hats. Okay, Mary, last question that kind of ties to this. This is when, when I posted on LinkedIn, I was like, these are the questions I'm asking Mary, the expert. What else do you want to know? Um, and one of my colleagues actually, who is a, is a board member, she said, as a board member, I always wonder what is that right amount of information that keeps us informed? Um, it allows us the time to be supportive, but like, um, sometimes I feel like I'm in the weeds on reviewing information. So it's like, maybe it is that line of like the governing and the day to day, but what is that line of, of information expectation and how do we set that and how do we make sure it's not too much, too little? Oh, this is a hard one Mm. because every board member has different needs in this area. Mm. I had a board member said, I just want bullet points. I don't want that much, but then you'd have another board member who wants enough. So I learned finally by making the mistake of trying to please everybody. I sat down with my board and I had the conversation. I can't provide 12 different sets of information. Mm -hmm. So let's start having a conversation about guidelines about what is it that you really need to know? Mm-hmm. How much detail do you want? And then we'll, we'll test it and see yeah. what can work. Some I can provide more information ahead of time in a report. And then for board meetings, we just, you, you read it if you need it. Or if you need more information, ask me. Yes. So it really is, that's a really difficult question because one of your roles as an executive in building your relationship with your board is to understand communication preferences. Mm. And when you know what an individual board member's preference is, try and honor it, but also let the whole board know that you don't have the capacity to give reports to separate people. And there needs a, there needs to be a compromise that's enough, but not too much. Yeah. So I know that's not. Yeah, but that, that, that anything, helps frame but... it up. I feel like it's a little bit like um, customizing donor experiences. It's like we can do it so much, but also oh, we can't do it for all 2000 of our donors, but we, we could do it in right. some way to our top 50 or our top 100. And it's, it's kind of that same principle. Right. Right. And that line, you know, to add to that, when you have board members who are getting in the weeds mm-hmm. and they're asking a lot of that kind of detail, then then you do need the board to say, we don't really need to know that. Yes. And yes. we're not going to ask for that. What we're what we want to be focused on is information that tells us results, mm-hmm. outcomes or how to make good decisions around a challenge or an issue. Yes. So it really depends on on what it is. Yeah. But, so good. You know. So good. Yeah. Mary, I know people are hearing this right now and saying, I need Mary Highland in my ear on a more regular basis. I, I think of this every time I'm talking to you. Um, you okay. mentioned it, but talk to me a little bit about how you work with organizations, your leadership, can I call it a cohort, um, how you're coming yes. alongside leaders in these issues and really equipping them. Um Tell me, tell me what you, what you do, where people can find you. Just lay it on me for somebody who's hearing this saying, I need help in this area. Okay. Well, first I am working now with executive directors primarily. I mean, a board could reach out to me for some education. Everything I do is virtual, but my focus is on supporting executive directors through mentoring. I hesitate to say coaching because people usually come to me to pick my brain Mm -hmm. about experiences, Um, but it's a combination of coaching and mentoring. So I do that and I'm very flexible about how much, how little you need. I do have a group. It's called the Nonprofit Leadership Circle. We meet months a month. It is for executive directors only. Um, And I'm looking to develop a new program on board member engagement. Mm. And I hope a group will come out of that, a mastermind group, but that's not there yet. Um, My website is Highland, spelled H-I-L, 
A-N-D, there's no G-H in there, H-I-L-A-N-D consulting.org, O-R-G. If you go to my website, you'll find uh, actually a free little gift on the first page, uh, the six steps you must know to unleash the potential of your nonprofit board. But also then you can reach me, just email me, Mary at highlandconsulting.org. And I th- there's a Let's Talk Contact Me page on my website too, where you can uh, schedule something and we'll chat. Good. No charge to chat. Good. I'll put those links in here too. Mary, thank you for your time and your wisdom. Oh, that's so fun. So fun. I'd love to and have you such back. Such great questions. Well, well, those are from my clients and I, I have the best clients. So uh, if I, I was like, if I can help them by uh, getting you to answer these, it, it helps me. So um, I just appreciate your and time. You, you, I just want to say you are doing amazing work. Oh. I mean, I think you have <laughs> done, uh, uh, you know, I haven't been in the room with you with clients, but, you know, I read your emails and you have really shifted the paradigm Thank about, you, I think, how boards need to be thinking about fundraising. And you, I don't Mary. see anybody else really doing that. So no. I just congratulate you and wish some of my poor clients could get the benefit <laughs> of you. Bring but, them on over. But I understand <laughs> what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, Thank I you, understand. You need to write a book. Oh, my goodness. I, I wrote a book, but you need to write a new book. Oh, my book, goodness. Right? No, I, I don't have a book. No, I, I don't have a book. You don't? Oh, well. I just yap. I don't. I don't. I don't have a, haven't written a book yet. Okay. So we'll maybe in the future, okay. but that's sweet of you. Okay. Thank you, Mary. That's so nice. Okay. All right. You are welcome. Thanks, Mary.